as I was telling Alan, this is really not, not this is a, a, a parallel research interest of mine. I, I, I'm very interested in studying the Irish economy, um, particularly uh, its collapse, obviously. But what I do half of my day really is macroeconomics. So I look at, uh, I'm, at the moment, I'm building a new macroeconomic model for Ireland. Um, so, so that's half of my job. The other half is looking at regulation. There are three main failings in the Irish crisis, in my opinion, and the, the Nyberg, the Regling and Watson and the Honan reports all b bring this out. The first is a political failure. Um, I'm not a political scientist. Don't even want to go there. Not interested. Um, the, there was obviously a failing of, of, of uh, regulation, and there was also a failing uh, to model the crisis. Um, if you look at all of the, um, if you look at all of the, the reports in 2006, 2007, uh, even some in 2008, um, you, you would be forgiven for thinking that everything was going tickety-boo. The reason was that most of the models were looking, were looking at the real side of the economy where you know, everything was still uh, going up. Um, and so in, financial, in the financial sectors, there was a, a huge buildup of unsustainable credit. And this was allowed to happen. So if you want to understand the Ar Ireland's economic crisis, the first thing you have to understand is how the model failed us. The second thing you have to understand is how the regulations failed us. So... Based on that, uh, I've been working uh, quite intensively with uh, a guy called Vince Dosolovo about this. So first off, I must apologize for the soup of acronyms I'm about to, de uh, about to uh, uh, drench you in. R one of the things that I'm... I'm, I'm uh, I, I, this is not my key area of expertise. I'm more a, I'm, I'm more a macroeconomist. Uh, my colleague, Vince Dosolovan, works with PricewaterhouseCoopers on the regulatory side, and he throws around these acronyms like they're going out of fashion. So um, I won't have time to stop and... Uh, uh, give you each one, um, and I, I would probably maybe only get seventy percent of them myself. So, so, if, but the important ones I will define along the way. So, I really like this quote from the philosopher John Gray. He's a fabulous book called Straw Dogs. Straw Dogs is about how humanism and the notion of human progress is actually illusory. What he basically says is, we have little idea of the future will we'll bring, but we are forced to live as if we are free. The cult of choice reflects the fact that we must improvise our lives, that we cannot do otherwise is a mark of our unfreedom. Choice has become a fetish, but the mark of a fetish is that it is unchosen. And uh, the book is absolutely fabulous, and you really sh should pick it up. It certainly, um, I found it extremely interesting and influential. But the, the message here really is that stop believing that you have a choice. Stop believing that you are an external agent in this, in this process. One of the very, very interesting things about the response that regulators have taken to the crisis um, is that they feel that they can choose arbitrary levels at which the economy or banks within the economy will lend and trade and save and consume and work and so forth. Uh, policymakers have the same hubris. I don't think you can get into the gig unless you believe that you can, in some sense, influence the level of unemployment or the rate of growth. Um, one of the promises of Keynesian economics is, in fact, that you can do this, of course, uh, if you believe Keynesian economics. But I, I just want to want you to hold that quote in your mind, this, this idea that we have a choice, and, or, or maybe that we don't. So a lot, this, is, this is part of a much larger and longer research project that I'm engaged in with uh, my colleague Vincent O'Sullivan. We've been banging away at this since 2009. And what we want to do is describe and model the interactions between regulation and the balance sheets of the European Union macroeconomy. We started looking at this from an Irish point of view. Um, this is a, obviously, I'm, I'm, I have the, the geographical specificity thing. I'm, I'm very interested in the Irish economy. But if you want to look at an area where regulation collapsed and failed completely, this is a very good case study, actually. Uh, and, and, and also, in terms of the journals, you know, I'm an academic. I'm a publisher and parish guy. If you want to write a, a really sexy article, it's a bit like hitting a, a, a beach ball with a tennis racket, you know, talking about how regulation in Ireland failed. But that's fine, uh, but, and that would be fine if, I, if, if, if we were just academics, but we're not. Vincent is a practitioner. He's, he, he works in the Centre for Regulatory Excellence in PricewaterhouseCoopers in London, and so he doesn't really care that I, I can produce nice graphs. He cares about how can you actually propose an alternative risk management mechanism? Can you make things a little bit safer um, or not? So, so we, we've looked at a lot of stuff, and um, I, I hope that will the slides be available online afterwards? Or, yeah, yeah. Um, um, that's great. Well, I've, I've given some references in the next slide. But what we've looked at really are regulatory complexity and uncertainty, um, particularly looking at the Capital Requirements Directive. Um, we've looked at you know, what caused the Irish banking crisis, UK regulatory reform, 
I have a bit of a rant in the Cambridge Journal of Economics about are we really the role model for austerity, looking back to the 80s, actually. Um, uh, and I don't think we are, is, is, the, is, the, is the answer. Um, uh, the Journal of Banking Regulation published something that, that, that was the, our first attempt at this, uh, what we're calling meta-risk regulation, where we take an idea from the uh, management of nuclear power plants and apply it to finance. Uh, what causes banking crisis is coming out, and all this stuff is all available on my website. There's more kind of stuff there. I'm not going to bore you with it, but basically it's all available online if you're interested to read it. So, okay, why is it important? First, first and foremost, the pace of reform has actually been feverish, even, even by, by reforming standards. It has been absolutely feverish. These guys have been working very hard to, to reform the, 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 the regulatory architecture at the European level. So while I, began in, while I began, I was very interested in looking at the Irish case. Actually, the Irish case is not that interesting, um, unless it's considered in its European context. Uh, obviously, we have higher capital requ requirements for banks. We've got regular, uh, we're looking at regulating credit agencies. And then there are, of course, further transparency and disclosure re requirements. The regulator are constantly saying, we need more and higher quality data. So the question is, okay, right, you've got all this data. What can you do with it? Can you actually analyze it? Do you have the facility to analyze it? Do you know what it is in the first place? Um, there's not that. There, there really isn't that. There really are no clear questions to any of this stuff. Um, of course, there are the recovery and resolution plans. Um, some of these are the grandiose EFSF, ESM stuff. The others are much smaller, much smaller and more uh, concrete, if you like, and implementable uh, problems. And then, of course, we have governance and internal controls requirements. Uh, I've put remuneration there in, in brackets because I, I, when, I, when I wrote the slide, I wasn't quite sure what the, uh, what the outcome of the... Um, uh, was it Barclays that, that they sued to get their bonuses back? They got it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, maybe not even with, with regard to remuneration. So regulators are really, uh, they're, 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 they were this sleepy guys in the back of a room all, all through the boom, and then suddenly they were expected to don the capes, jump out the windows and solve the problem. Um, now some of them may actually want to jump out the windows afterwards. There's the European Banking Authority, the European Security Markets Authority, the Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority. These are just the big ones. I'm going to show you a chart in a minute showing you the rest of them. We have a new EU macro prudential uh, regulator. Um, and then, of course, we now have a, a push to a single rule book. About, I think, a week ago um, or 10 days ago, there was a big conference uh, of, all the, of all of Europe's regulators in the convention center here in Dublin. And it was absolutely fascinating sitting there. Um, they're very smart, very subtle uh, thinkers, extremely interesting people. And um, they, even through their guarded language, you got the sense that they didn't really know what was coming next. And that was... That, that certainly, that certainly uh, uh, brought it home to me that they are operating in as much of an ins environment of uncertainty as, w as you know, policymakers, proper policymakers are. Uh, their big issue was the creation of the single rule book, this notion that you would somehow stop regulatory arbitrage. And so for the uninitiated, regulatory arbitrage is where you have bank A that's choosing to locate in, in, in country A or country B. And... Bank A is essentially going to each country saying, yeah, but their capital requirements are easier and they're nicer to us, and so bring it down. Um, uh, multinational, uh, very large banking systems can actually do this. And, of course, the issue then is not, is there a single rule book? The issue is, how is the single rule book implemented? How do you make sure that um, you know, Unicredit, which is a global bank, uh, operates in exactly the same fashion in Italy as it does in Germany? when they're dealing with two completely different legal systems, two completely different uh, um, sets of customs and institutional regularities, how do they do this? This is a very, very difficult problem to solve. It's, it's not simple. Um, and in fact, one of, the, one of the things I'm going to talk about in a minute is complexity. Now, these are intrusive uh, and judgments-based supervisory philosophies. The notion is we know better. Now, they clearly don't know better. If they knew better, they wouldn't be asking for all the information. Okay, there is a problem of asymmetric information in this, in this system that we simply cannot solve. And it's, 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 it's owning up to that lack of information that I, I, we're, we're really um, pushing on at the moment. So the principle-based or risk-based regimes, I think we can all say with confidence that they failed. You cannot have a principles-based um, uh, system, nor can you have a risk-based system when the banking system has clearly shown that it doesn't know, know how to value risk correctly, especially things like credit risk. Um, Principles-based stuff, 
uh, I think you just you, people will start laughing at you if you bring it back. And there's lots more to come. So, so these are the series of regulatory innovations, if you like. They're coming down the line from the second quarter of 2012 all the way to 2019 when Basel III is fully adopted uh, um, everywhere, I think, except the United States. I don't think they've signed up to it yet. So uh, we're looking at, right now, the, the, big, the big thing is algorithmic trading, and you can see uh, proponents of algorithmic trading, people who would never have gone on Bloomberg or CNN before once in their lives, coming out saying, actually, no, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't regulate, we provide all the liquidity in the markets. Um, the RRPs are coming in, um, maybe the Dodd-Frank Volcker rule by qu third quarter 2012, CAS resolution packs, RDR, co-reps, and so forth. That's only in 2012. Uh, by 2014, uh, we're going to have these FICOL initiatives. And then all the way up, and again, this is why I had to apologize in advance for the acronym soup, folks, because it really is uh, exhausting. And then all the way up to 2019. So we have, we, there's, a, there's a plan, there's a plan to basically re-regulate all of the major product categories in the European financial system over the next seven to eight years. And I think that's the, that is stunningly ambitious it's extremely challenging. Even getting one of these right is going to be really tough. And you can see that they've got them all to do. So the, the policy response has been knee-jerk. There was a problem. The Irish and European economies, but let's just pick Ireland for example, the Irish economy was like a marble rolling off a table in terms of regulation. Everything was grand up until the quarter that it wasn't. And then it you know, suddenly fell over. And these guys are supposed to come in and stop that from happening again. Now, what, we're, what I'm going to argue, what we're arguing now uh, in this book that's coming out in a while, is that that's impossible. You can't expect regulators to do this because, not, because regulators are not external to the financial system. They're not an exogenous shock in the, in the words of an economist and in the language of an economist. What they are actually, they're part of the system. Um, and they experience cycles as well. And so what you're really looking at in this chart, if you, if you want to be very cynical, is a job scheme. <laughs> For, for, for regulatory economists and, uh, 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 and policy wonks, every one of these requires a highly paid director and a lar reasonably large secretariat. There's, there's, go there's gold plated pensions all over the shop here, folks. It'll all work out. However, will this actually achieve anything? Um, people who run banks will say no, actually. The regulated tend to not like the regulators. Uh, one big problem that we've identified as part of our research, and I think we're, we're, up, we're up upwards of 15 papers now on this, um, the regulatory agenda in Europe does not have a rigorous macroeconomic analysis part to it. There's no sense in which the regulatory framework is actually understood as part of the macroeconomy. There's a very good reason for this. Most regulators are not economists. They don't talk to economists. And um, if they met an economist at a party, they'd run away from them. I've ha I am an economist, so I've had this happen to me. Um, they, they're, they're, they're lawyers, so uh, they, don't want, they don't look at this, they're not trained to look at this. However, we are, we are, we are sitting in, in, the, the, in an economy where regulation clearly failed, so they do have a macroeconomic uh, part to play. Now, uh, when you talk to regulators about this, they will say, well, no, no, hang on, hang on, stall the digger now, stop, stop. Well, they're, they're all Europeans, so they don't say stall the digger. You know, uh, maybe they do in a German accent, stall the digger. They say... Uh, we have cost-benefit analysis. We've done this. Cost-benefit analysis is the way forward. Uh, I, I've argued very strongly, and the OECD actually have backed us up. Cost-benefit analysis accompanying regulations is not adequate to figure out whether the regulation is going to be adopted, is going to be a success or a failure. It's simply not adequate in a, in a situation where you have so much uncertainty. It's, it simply won't work. Um, so maybe the job scheme for the cost-benefit analysis guys might go away. So... Right, why does this matter? Why does you know, one more economist making one more model matter? Uh, okay, it matters because if you don't have the correct analytical framework, then this actually obstructs authorities implementing the reforms in the face of mounting opposition. You have to be able to say, look, if we don't implement this particular set of legislations and you guys blow up again, this is going to be the macroeconomic impact. That's what we want to be able to say. And I think that's, there's a value in saying that. There's not a lot of predictive power in, in, in economic models, but you can get pretty close to a weather model, actually, in this. Now, 
That's fine. Uh, but what I've learned as a macroeconomist talking to a regulatory economist the whole time is that when we model banks in, in traditional economics, the way we model them is sort of mechanistically. You know, you drop the interest rate and they'll increase lending as if they're sort of, you know, t tin men. But of course they're not. They're, they're, they're organis organisms in a way on their own. Uh, but actually, so you've, the policymakers knee jerk reacting saying we must regulate more, regulate uh, uh, the banks to bits. Well, there's push and pull back from everybody. Regulators are now being asked to do the devil and all when it comes to this stuff. You know, the regulators have insufficient resources. At all times, all regulatory systems are characterized by limited resources. So it's very difficult for, for one person with a, with a staff of 25 to, you know, and a budget of you know, 6 million to, to regulate a, a banking system that's 3,000 times its size. Uh, at the conference a couple of uh, days ago, uh, a, a leading uh, European regulator um, who was giving a speech at the time said, you know, I look out of my window, in, in, which is in the city of London, and I look around at all the buildings, and I think of all the people that are sitting there who are paid four times more than me, thinking up ways to beat the rules that I haven't invented yet. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. And they're you know, it's, it's hard. These guys are sitting there, they're making 100 grand a year, and they're talking to a guy who's making 800 grand a year. And what they don't realize is they're being interviewed for the job. <laughs> so um, firms, of course, firms are, 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 are cash-strapped. Cash um, uh, keeping retained earnings and cash flow is, of course, the name of the game. However, uh, the firms themselves, and when I say firms, I'm not talking about Stephen's secondhand bookshop stop here. I, I'm thinking far more about IBM and Microsoft. They're interested in raising high quality capital. They're interested in keeping their uh, uh, profit margins high or staying in business, surviving even. And so the firms don't want to be regulated because regulation is basically a, an increase in, in the cost of uh, doing business. Investors, therefore, face lower returns on equity. Industrial organizations are worried and of course, the general public, the general public are frustrated by the slow pace of change. And uh, I think, if there's if there's one thing that 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 will sap the public's ability to absorb pain, it's the fact that they don't see any change, uh, uh, and over uh, the medium term, say three to five years. So, what do I mean by regulation? Okay, you recognize you recognize that banking is unstable. It's important to impose rules to constrain risky behavior. No one will argue with this. This is a bit like saying, would you like growth or not, mom and apple pie? Everybody agrees that, yes, banking is unstable. It has been unstable for at least 800 years. Um, you want to impose these rules. However, these rules carry a cost. The first cost they carry is they damage the real economy. The more uh, rules that you impose, the more difficult it is for the bank to lend uh, correctly, and the more difficult, therefore, it is for the, for, for, uh, the real economy to flourish. However, if you leave these guys... Uh, go run amok, then the, the system explodes. And that's exactly what we saw in 1825, in 1840, in 1870. And I'll, I'll show you a, a few more now. And we have capital adequacy ratios, Basel 1, 2, 3. It's now about 8% of risk-weighted assets. For those of you that did first year and second year economics, I'm sure that there's a cold uh, chill running down your back as you remember the reserve ratio in the ISLM model. It's the same thing here, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we have the usual stuff about tier one capital, capital uh, and the risk-weighted uh, risk um, bundles of uh, capital and uh, repo issues and all of that. Uh, but I'm, I'm not specifically concerned with that, actually. Um, the one thing I will mention about this is that valuation issues abound. It's not possible to correctly value a lot of these assets. Uh, you know, you could have a large uh, series of mortgages on your book right now. You have a massive valuation uh, uh, issue, and if you're using the, uh, uh, those mortgage-backed securities as repo for cash for uh, the to, through the ECB, they don't know what they're holding either. So it's sort of past the parcel, and the parcels are fizzling down. Eventually, it may blow up on you. So that's what I mean by regulation. Now I want to talk to you about our theoretical frame. I've been very in influenced by three uh, economists. Charlie Kindleberger, Hyman Minsky, and Richard Koo. Uh, Charlie Kindleberger was an MIT economic historian who wrote an amazing book called Manias, Panics, and Crashes, uh, where he basically developed a theory, a, a verbal theory, uh, of how banking crises happen. Hyman Minsky was a, uh, a much ignored in his lifetime economist who, who said essentially that banking banking exists for credit and credit creates its own reversal. In, a, in a, an amazing 
an amazingly poorly written book called Stabilizing an Unstable Economy in 1986. He essentially showed, using a series of historical case studies, that it was the case that after a slump, after a really bad bust, the economy took time to recover. As it took time to recover, uh, regulators beefed up regulations. Banks didn't lend out into the real economy unless they lent to very, very simple, very well put together uh, projects. And that's more or less where we are right now. Um, then right after that, something happens. Either the economy continues to recover and so more projects uh, uh, come back in and the guys are making money. Then, they, then they, they start lobbying to reduce the number of regulations. They start saying, no, 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 people are forgetting it's five, ten years down the line now. Suddenly the regulations get cut back a bit, lending comes up, there's a little bit of financial innovation, whatever, a little bit of risk mispricing. Suddenly interest rates drop or, or, or the economy begins to boom. Then more and more risky projects get funded. As this happens, asset prices take off. Once the asset prices take off, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where everybody sees, oh my God, the price of that house is going up. I'm an idiot for not getting in the market, so on and so forth. So the, the economy experiences a euphoric moment, actually. The, so he describes it as euphoria, Minsky. And then eventually something happens. Uh, the, the assets are so unanchored from their fundamentals, they simply explode. Uh, we had the subprime crisis in this case. It was the jump bond fiasco in the 80s. Um, and and uh, we, can, we can point back to the, to the pin, the prick, the bubble, essentially. Uh, the economy explodes, or implodes, rather, um, I don't need to tell anybody about that. But basically, in that moment, regulation knee jerks again. People go, oh my God, we need to re-regulate. So people will, people will recognize that the largest explosion of regulation and institutional creation that, uh, uh, ever really was right after the Great Depression. Um, and we're seeing the same event. It's the same thing. Uh, this time is not different. Okay? Everybody realizes that because credit has created its own reversal, you end up with massive leverage. You end up with a balance sheet disaster. This is Ku's point. Um, regulation then becomes necessary to attenuate the scale of the crisis. But of course, all that regulation does is close the door after the horse is bolted. Regulation builds up again. Things calm down. They get a little bit better. The regulation gets knocked down again. The cycle continues. This is why it's called the Minsky cycle. And the moment when it pops is called the Minsky moment. I should say that this is not the... Uh, Paul Krugman um, uh, and Gary Egertsen have, have, a, have a very good paper where they try to synthesize Kindleberger, Minsky and Q, but the problem is they're, 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 they're throwing chalk at cheese and trying to make a ham sandwich. It's very difficult to do. Uh, so, so, so when I'm talking about this, please don't, don't think that I'm talking about the Egertsen-Krugman story. Uh, I have my own story uh, in 2009 in a book by, edited by Ronan Keane. So... Uh, in the absence of effective monetary policy, Ireland does not have its own monetary policy. We don't have a fiscal policy, in, uh, uh, at least not an expansionary fiscal policy. Regulation is the third best or at least you know, least worst solution. But actually, uh, given where we are, it is the route to successful reform. Now, everyone has decided this. And I'm wary when the majority say anything, actually. Uh, but regulation is part of the system. It's not external to it. It's, it's, it's a part of this cycle that we're going to describe in a minute. Regulation, like choice, has become a fetish. Yeah? And the problem of the fetish, as, jo as John Gray says, is that it's not built around choice. It's choice-free. Okay? We must be aware of its limitations. Uh, so, really, the purpose of, of regulation is to change behavior. I, uh, we were talking about, I have three kids, and I, oh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a garden, and the garden has a very, very high wall. It's about a 10-foot wall. The, one, the, the, the largest child is five. There's no way, unless he turns into Batman, he's going to be able to get over that wall. However, the wall blocks the view, um, and uh, uh, it's a bit scary sometimes, because there's... there's uh, the land behind our house, it, it, it's sloping down and the guy who owns the land has two horses. So occasionally we're having breakfast and a horse kind of sticks his head over the, <laughs> over the, over, over the roof, which is quite, a bit, quite, quite, quite scary of a, of a morning, you know, this disembodied horse staring at you. However, uh, the way, way I think about it is that regulation essentially is a political concept. It's not an economic concept at all. It's political. And... and um, we need to understand it in relation to, its, to the economic organization it's trying to influence. What that means, if you believe that story, that means that regulating unicredit 
regulating Unicredit in Italy and in Germany is, is a fundamentally impossible thing to do because there's two totally different legal systems. Even if you wiped out the legal system in Germany totally and just imposed the Italian one, you'd still have problems because there's, there are cultural differences. So that means when a German regulator comes to talk to an Irish regulator, even if they're speaking in English, they might be, uh, as Moliere says, speaking in prose. Yeah, they might find it very difficult to actually speak to one another. Now, the reason I think we should regulate, um, that there are three reasons why you want to. We want to reduce the externalities, the huge blow-ups associated with banking. Um, and and, and uh, that's really what's interesting to me. And it's why, why uh, I remember reading a, a quote from someone saying, you know, the, these, these banks are toxic. They're like toxic waste. The, the, what they produce, these bad debts are like toxic waste. And I, it got me thinking, I remembered reading a, uh, I remember reading a, uh, a story about how they had coped with the failure at Three Mile Island, the, 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 nuclear, the almost nuclear meltdown. Um, and uh, it, it got me thinking that maybe, maybe we, should, we should view you know, bad debt as sort of like nuclear waste, actually. Um, because... Uh, some of the stuff does have a half-life of maybe 50 years. So uh, the other interesting thing is regulators are not, um, you know, superheroes. They're not sitting there waiting to change everything. They are themselves bureaucracies, and the one thing bureaucracy wants to do is expand. So the crisis has, it's, has been a beautiful job screen, jobs, jobs initiative, if you like, for uh, regulators. Uh, right, why does it matter? The Risk Society is a beautiful book by uh, Colin Scott where he, he talks about this, the Risk Society, where the government is, is increasingly responsible for regulating risk. I'm on the board of management of my local school and it's very clear that the parents expect the school to regulate the risky environment that their children are in. Um, I'm not so sure when I went to school that my father and mother expected that of, the, of CBC Monkstown. I think... I can imagine the principal in the 1980s having, this, having the kind of discussion that we're having now. Um, so the, this regulatory state, the big government, the European Union, actually, uh, according to Minsky, is a good thing. The reason it's a good thing is because the only thing that can attenuate the scale of the crisis is big government, the big bank, the big government. The banks blow up, they need to have somewhere to amortise their debts. They need to have something to absorb it all. Um, and that is the the big bank. Unfortunately, what that does is that institutionally legitimizes the failure. It says, it, in, it, it injects moral hazard into the system because what it says is, oh, you messed up. Okay, well, what are we going to do? We're going to allow this system to collapse? No. Well, what are we going to do instead? Um, I, I think we should probably save them. But once saving them, Why you've just told them. I'm just, oh, no, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea. Actually, I don't know. I'm sorry. Sorry, you, you, you're the one who'd go down the cape afterwards. You know? Yeah, you, 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 were, you, you weren't... Um... Actually, yeah, you're, 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 this, is, this is now your problem, actually, yeah, in many ways. So, uh, and then, of course, the collapse of Enron the, that created the Sarbanes Oxley Act. Um, but one is re re reflexive and reactive to the other. So we have this, this problem. This is, this is how I like to organize my thinking around this. Right now, two big problems. Balance sheet damage. So these are the balance sheets of... Uh, firms of banks of governments. The balance sheet is in bits. Um, uh, here, I better look at you, Alan, because, yeah, again, this is your problem. Damaged balance sheets. Fiscal constraints, you can't spend your way out of the problem um, at all. And then the regulator comes along and they're asked, okay, fix it. Well, the regulator faces three main challenges, coordination, complexity, and, and contagion. Uh, the contagion I have in yellow there is because that's the thing everybody wants to avoid. The problem with Greece is not that uh, everybody is worried about the Greek citizens per se, actually. It's that they really don't want French and German banks to go belly up, because if they do, Irish and UK banks will follow suit, and then Obama won't get re-elected, and so on and so forth. So this is how most economists think about a balance sheet. This is from a, a, a paper by Andy Haldane of the uh, Financial Stability Authority in the UK, uh, uh, Prasad Guy and Sonny Kapadia in the Journal of Monetary Economics. It's the biggest journal in monetary economics in the world. It's a, it's a really, really uh, great paper, and I'm going to show you a chart from it in a second. But this is the state of the art. Anybody with any accountancy practice would be looking at this going, really? Is this really it? Is this how, this is really how economists, like this, the, like this was published last year. This is really how economists view balance sheets? And say, 
Yeah. You know, we do. They said, really? Yeah. And this is pretty complicated. To model this properly is pretty complicated. So uh, this is the current balance sheet view. However, this looks at one bank. And the problem is with regulators and, 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 and everybody who isn't a macroeconomist effectively, uh, here I put in the, the cape on the macroeconomist, the macroeconomist looks at it a bit like this. It's all balance sheets, basically. Uh, this is how I look at it. This is how I think about the economy. Um, so we have households and firms, governments, central banks, commercial banks, special purpose vehicles, leverage finance, shadow banking, all that stuff, and then the rest of the world. One of the really interesting things about this chart, or this, this table, if you like, is that it gives you a sense of the interconnections of one balance sheet with another. And I think that's vital. I think, I think actually policymakers understand this at, a, at an intuitive level. They understand that if you, if you let banks fail, as intellectually satisfying and sort of morally satisfying as that would be, you're going to damage households and the firms. You're probably going to get voted out of power. Um, uh, the commercial banks would be in bits and the rest of the world will fall apart too. I think they naturally understand the connections between these things. Um, they don't explain that to the public um, quite well. Um, all, the all the public see is you're bailing out corrupt bankers, right? And that's, that's hard, that's hard to do. However, one of, one of the things that's really, really interesting when you look at this is, if this is where the problem is, then this is also where the solution is. The solution is to look at this and say, okay, what is the one actor within the system that isn't bound by constraints, that isn't bound by constraints. The bank, the bank, uh, the, the, the commercial bank there at the bottom left, it's bound by the fact that the, si the two sides of that must, must balance. It, it is bound by that by law. Um, it is a fiduciary responsibility to that. Special purpose vehicles, NAMA and so forth, maybe they don't have the same amount of, of problems. Leverage finance, who knows, basically. However, we are sure we are sure that the one actor within the system that has the ability to change one side of that balance sheet is the central bank. It can change those bank reserves as and when it wants. It can change them because it just creates money. I was, in, I was driving up today and I was listening to an interview that Pat Kenny was doing with um, Shane Ross. And he was saying, is the problem basically that the Germans are giving money to the ECB and then the ECB is giving money to us? So why don't we just cut the ECB out of it at all? Pat doesn't understand that the Germans don't give any money to the ECB. The ECB just says, there's money there today, and thus it is created. It means that the way to heal the balance sheets of this system is for the ECB to expand its mandate. But that's a, that's a, bit, like, that's a bit like asking my 72-year-old Uncle Pat to wear a dress. He's not going to do it. Yeah, He can do it, but he's not going to. So it's, a, it's an extra constraint, and it's a political constraint. It's not a constraint that the balance sheet itself holds. The, the, the problem within the European system, economically, is a problem that can be solved with the big bank, if you look at it like this. Expanding bank reserves allows the liabilities of all of the other actors to be amortized. I think that's very, very important. There are, of course, fiscal issues. This is from the... Uh, the European Macroeconomic Surveillance Initiative that, uh, you, that the European Commissioner are undertaking at the moment. This is the European system. The ones in grey there, what you're looking at really um, are, are the internal imbalances within the European countries. When they're in grey, it means they're in, in excess of the stability and growth pact uh, uh, processes. You can see um, private sector debt uh, in Ireland, you know, 124%, I think. Uh, no, 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 that can't be right. 341%, yeah, that's right. Um, public sector debt, 93. This is 2010, remember. Remember for the halcyon days when we only had a debt-to-GDP ratio of 93%. Now it's 108.2. Um, and so forth, the average unemployment rate. You can see quite clearly, you can see quite clearly that, that the set of fiscal issues, and these are only the internal imbalances. These are only the internal ones. There are a suite of other external ones that are there, are considerable. How do you solve these? I guess my point with these two slides is to show you that monetary policy and fiscal policy, they're both incredibly constrained. They can't really get us out of this problem. Either they're unable or they're unwilling to. All those countries in grey there are going to find it very, very difficult to pursue basic Keynesian demand expansion policies, even though we're hearing about a 200 billion euro growth pact, um, which presumably Francois Hollande is going to go, mine, thank you very much. Um, even then, I, 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 I would, I would uh, 
use this and other uh, pieces of evidence to argue that fiscal policy is not really the way out of this. Um, okay, so if that's the case, if fiscal and monetary policy are out the window if, largely, then we have to look at regulation. However, regulation has its own set of problems, coordination and complexity. This is another chart from the Haldane, Guy and Kapadia paper um, uh, 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 looking at this. You're looking at the network of large exposures between the UK banks in 2008. They are highly, highly connected. Highly connected. Um, which, 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 red, which one of those red dots do you think is the Bank of England, by the way? Which one? It's in the centre there somewhere, but which one is it? Well, I'll give, you a cl- I'll give you a clue. It's not the biggest one. Isn't that a bit frightening? It's not the biggest one. The other figure shows the concentration of the UK and the US banking systems. Uh, here you can see, uh, these are just using the Herfeldahl in- Index, basically, uh, most banks have gotten bigger. This is evidence, in fact, for the Minsky, the Minsky uh, thesis that what happens is the big banks become too big to fail. Their, they, their failures are institutionally le- legitimized. They're allowed to carry on. When things get better, they eat the weaker banks. That's basically uh, what has happened. And you can see that in the UK and the US, um, the largest banks have this complexity and coordinate, uh, concentration issue. Um, the coordination... Uh, Problem, the problem of coordinating how to regulate these vast systems of, of banks between various countries uh, and the difficulty of regulatory arbitrage that comes from it actually comes from uh, or was recognized it by uh, Adrian Heritor, who's a, a prominent um, uh, economist. Back in 1996, she was saying, this is going to be a problem. It's going to blow up on us because we can't regulate all of these things uh, effectively. Um, at that time, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, supervisory, or supervisory authority, authorities on top of the national regulators. Um, now, of course, we still don't have a solution to financial innovation just yet. Um, and actually, uh, from talking to a couple of regulators, there's no sense in which they want to remove financial innovation from the system, which I, 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 I find that very interesting. I understand why they're saying that. I find it very interesting. So, uh, there's the other issue, which is the complexity of the rules. Um, Dodd-Frank is enormous, absolutely enormous. Sarbanes-Oxley, enormous pieces of of legislation. Um, You know, somebody somebody made the joke that, uh, I think think the Bible is, uh, or the Ten Commandments are about, you know, a page and a half in good, in good good, good, good sized text. The Code of Hammurabi is kind of two pages long. Uh, the European regulations on cucumbers is 26,000 pages. Yeah, so, you know, we, we, we've had a go at, at increasing the complexity of the rule sets. They haven't done it. And what they ensure is that implementation won't be the same. That means that regulatory arbitrage will be there. If you're a banker sitting in this room, you're going, happy days. This is great. It means that we're going to be able to make as much money as we did before just by diverting a little bit more resources into regulation. However, it does also mean that within the current re-regulated process are the seeds for the collapse of the next, um, the next economy, maybe when my son's a teenager. So here's Haldane. As a thought experiment, imagine instead we're designing a regulatory framework from scratch. Finance is a complex adaptive system. What properties would this ideally exhibit? Simplicity. We would regulate with simplicity. Uh, the key lesson here, faced with complexity, you try to get more complex than the problem you're trying to solve. However, when you do that, you introduce more complexity. Uh, so we could, we could search for simple and robust rules to do this. And if the banks were mechanistic systems, then this would be very easy to do. However, they're reacting the entire time to this. So how do you stop this? How do you stop this? Well, as I was saying to, to Alan earlier on, the simplest thing to do, there would be no more problems, we just increase the capital adequacy ratio to 25%, go home, you know, s- sign the paper, <laughs> sign the paper there, minister, boom, and uh, then it's all good. The problem is, uh, the next day, the entire banking system will collapse. Um, so we can't do that. Um, so faced with the fact that we can't do that, can we come up with simpler ways to do it? Uh, the uh, Stanford economist, Anna Admati, for example, has 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 proposed that we end the subsidy to holding debt and try to get large financial institutions to hold more equity. Um, this, is a, this is a good proposal in my view. In practice, I think this may be more difficult uh, because 
Who is going to stand on the other side of a trade for Irish sovereign debt right now? Not me. Um, and I'm a green jersey wearer I, I, a lot of the time. So, for example, this is from a paper that we looked at. Uh, we looked at the ESMA's regulation of the credit, regent, credit rating agencies. So these were, these, these, what you're looking at there, that, that big dense bar, paragraph, these are the headings of the, regula of the regulatory and white papers uh, that came out just to regulate one thing. So we've massively increased the level of complexity involved in regulation. And I guess the question is, uh, I guess the question is, will this actually solve the problem? It, will, it may dampen it down for a while, but what you've created essentially is a, is a storm in which very smart bankers can dance between the raindrops. So coordination. Uh, coordination is the other issue uh, and implementation. The historical context, of course, is that all of this has happened before. I, I've talked about our, our frame. I've talked about our frame uh, before. Regulation, I don't think, is the solution to attenuating the Minsky cycle. Uh, it can only make it. It can only reduce it if we're very, very careful about what we do. This is a, a, a lovely chart. These are capital ratios from 1870 to 2007. You can see a couple of things. The first is that the first is that this is for the UK, the US, and uh, four other countries. First is that we are in a historically low period of capital uh, adequacy of capital ratios um, for for various banks, um, and what I what I would like you all to think about is what do you think that line has to come up to? What do you think that line has to come up to to make a stable system or to reduce the probability of an extreme event, a really big explosion? Ten percent, you know, eight percent, twenty percent. What 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 should it be? What should it be? Because that's a, that's a big it's a big question. It's a big question. It's not easy to answer. But you can see that over the historical cycle, basically things have been getting more fragile. To use uh, Nassim Taleb's view, Here, here's the capital adequacy ratios from Schulrich, Jordan, and Taylor. Again, over the same period, uh, again you can see they're just getting much, much, much smaller. Uh, as essentially the private risk from the bank is transferred into the public purse, to the public uh, uh, risk over time, um, as they get insured by the big bank. Right, digression on the Irish crisis. The next three charts I'm going to show you are essentially uh, data that we took from the uh, regulatory authorities. Um, uh, you know, the, the argument has been we didn't know, no one told us. Actually, you did know. These, this is, all this data is coming from the regulator's own uh, uh, information set from their annual accounts each year. Total assets and total customer loans, residents exploded. Here's non-financial sector lending. It exploded. Um, now again, if you're in 1995, this is clearly not a problem. But if you're, if you're looking at this in 2004 and 2005, the line is, is basically 70 degrees. You know, you've got to be worried about this stuff. This is the increase in the loan book. In percentage increases... I've got to look at you again, Alan, sorry. It's not, but, but actually, just, just to give you... An, there, Alan joins here. Yeah, so here's, there, there's the Jukes moment. So it's all good. Um, uh, but you can see, you can see the increase. In the, and that's a percentage increase year on year. So, so, so the, they, they knew that it was there. Or if they didn't know, they had the information. And there's that crucial distinction between information and knowledge. Right. History repeats itself. In financial matters, because of a kind of sophisticated stupidity, to quote uh, J.K. Galbraith, the world of finance hails the invention of the wheel over and over again, often in a slightly more unstable form. And the banking crisis has hammered growth. So you can see recessions with banking crisis and without. They're two different beasts, basically. Two completely different beasts. They take, they, they take an awful lot longer to resolve and they damage potential output um, for up, upwards of a decade. Actually, we're not that different from the past. So the distance in years from the first year of the crisis is here. So uh, we've output losses. This is the difference in, in output losses here. The European Union is tracking... Roughly speaking, the Great Depression. We have a massive debt problem, but the ECB is carrying it for us. Uh, Jörg Asmussen was speaking here. His point was very, very clear. This, this uh, in fact, uh, is the ECB and its, 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 its mandate expanding massively over time. The flow of funds in the Eurozone has, shows us very clearly, very clearly, that the banking system is not doing what it should be doing. Okay? Uh, which is a big worry. 
But of course, you've got deleveraging, and that creates credit growth and decay. I'm just going to leave you with this. Could you please hand that out? Uh, this is a chart that I developed l- looking at the top 20 banks in Europe and their deleveraging over a nine-month period. It's a slope graph. I'll explain it to you in a little while. But basically, one of the big challenges is getting banks with large amounts of debt to deleverage quickly without destroying the economy. Uh, and this is very, very difficult. So what are the current challenges? The crisis is evolving, and today's solution is not tomorrow's. We actually live in a low, high-quality information environment. So the high-quality information is the stuff that was in that chart before. But the information that every bank has to submit to the regulator may be actually low-quality information, or they, they might be very difficult to get any knowledge out of it. We must realize that banks are not passive actors. Regulation doesn't help them, in fact, um, to change. And balance, and this is something I, I can't stress enough, is not something to strive for. Regulators and policymakers look for balance. I don't think it's possible to do it. So we have a nice, uh, a nice model that we, we, we like to look at. This is building on the Minsky view. The basic idea is the first thing that happens after the collapse is save us, you know, regulate. And then assess the problem, which is kind of where we are now. Then redesign the, finan- the financial regulatory architecture. That's going to take the next seven years. You've got to legislate for that. Then you have to implement that. That's the big change, implementing it. And then people go, well, hang on. Do we really need all these regulations, all this red tape? Got it. You rethink it. And then the, it all blows up again. Right. Big issues for us. How long can the ECB support our banks? How long can fiscal policy support them? Uh, How do these banks raise capital? How do they maintain any kind of profitability? What is going to be done about shadow banking? Um, We've been writing a lot about this recently. Um, What is going to be done about it? Um, Macroprudential supervision. Who does it? How do do they do do it? Why? Are there good regulation principles? Um, I'll talk about this later. What's the future? Okay. The Three Mile Island meltdown uh, in 1979... Was, was, it was a, a fascinating process. The, 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 the later problem, the problem that came afterwards was quite simple. How did we get this wrong, lads? We followed all the rules. They realized that um, while they were following the rule books, they hadn't in any way built in the capacity to evaluate risks. So they couldn't evaluate their risk management system. They couldn't figure out, is what we're looking at and what we're trying to get away from, is that a good risk management system or a bad one. And the nuclear industry has this risk analysis intelligence system. Interestingly, the only country that didn't adopt this is Japan. Uh, So a regulator needs to establish institutional structures to support a move towards this meta-risk regulation. How they do that uh, and connecting that into the next macroeconomic framework is the next step. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.